introduce uh, Kirsten Horton, um, who is a senior policy advisor at the Str Strategic Senior Spatial Energy Plan uh, at the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. And uh, Kirsten has been crucial in developing uh, the UK's first geospatial energy plan. Uh, as strategies use maps and location data to find the best places for energy projects. And uh, she previously uh, managed the passage of the Energy Security Bill, uh, coordinating with over 200 civil servants, uh, guiding policy inclusion and reaching senior officials. And with over five years uh, as a senior policy advisor, uh, she helped shape the UK's fuel poverty strategy and engage with key stakeholders. And Kirsten also has a background in STEM education, uh, having taught year four students and developed science workshops. And uh, she holds MA in Public Policy from King's College London uh, and a Bachelor's in Education from the University of Alberta. So, uh, as Kirsten shares the uh, presentation on pathways to impact in public uh, policy, you're also very welcome to start submitting questions on the swap card um, and kind of on, on the slide only that you can access through the swap card uh, app or via the YouTube uh, video. So, I reckon to to the floor. Thank you. All right, well, I, I feel like I've, there's been quite a good introduction for me. I'm going to try to give an overview um, of what I've learned about the different ways people can make a difference through policy careers. Um, so some of that will be about things I've experienced, and some of that will be about the type of people that I've worked with uh, to hopefully give a flavor of the type of careers. Um, but also the type of things that people can do outside of their 9 to 5 to potentially have an impact through policy and, and politics. Um, my first introduction to politics was actually because of my faith. Um, I mean, my parents talked a lot about politics when I was growing up, but when I was 17 I joined a faith-based group um, who went on a, a trip to Ottawa. We were from all over the country, it was young people, and we met with more than 70 members of parliament, which in Canada is a big deal because they only have like 300. Um, and so that was a really like formative experience for me. I got to meet with my own member of parliament who was a Catholic and gave me some really useful advice as well about, um, about policy and how faith fits in with that. Um, so that was a really formative experience for me. And after I went home, I kept um, getting in touch with members of parliament in Canada where I'm from. Um, Including in one situation, I, I contacted a member of parliament from a, a political party that I didn't really support to tell him that I thought he did a good job at a particular thing, and he was so confused that he <laughs> called me. <laughs> His office was like, this is really strange, like the 17-year-old has like, written us with like a compliment, like, maybe we should talk to her. <laughs> um, so that was a really neat experience, it gave me a lot of optimism to think about about how people's engagement can actually shape things, that it's not just you're kind of shouting into the void, like there are people on the other side listening to you, which was a really cool experience for me. Uh, after moving to the UK and marrying a, a British citizen here, I've been working in the UK civil service. Um, I, I was a teacher for the first couple of years I moved here, but um, it's been five or six years uh, in the civil service, depending on if you count my maternity leaves. Um, so yeah, I've, I've published a, a strategy to help people who can't afford to heat their homes. I helped pass the Energy Act 2023, and I've been in charge of negotiating with the Scottish and Welsh governments about how we'll coordinate, um, and I've worked on planning for new energy infrastructure. So it's been uh, a lot of different energy-related things and a lot of different kind of climate-related things uh, that I've gotten the chance to work on. Um, so today I'm going to talk about four different ways that I've seen people make a difference in policy. Uh, one is moving forward important policies. This will probably take up the, uh, about half of our time because there's a lot you can do to move forward important policies. There's a lot of a lot of space for people to work and develop new niches. Another is developing projects that are high expected value policies that are high expected value, even if you don't think they're actually going to move forward or you hope they're never going to move forward. Uh, so this could be things like um, working on pandemic preparedness, you know, considering national security risks. You hope that those things never come to pass, but actually you really want someone to be thinking about those things and it's, it's worth spending some time on them potentially, um, even if your policy doesn't have an impact every time. 
Uh, another is working with really skilled altruistic policymakers. It doesn't have to be you making the great policy. If you are still causing it to happen in some way, that can still be a really impactful thing. And finally, equipping policymakers for success. So making sure that they have the information, making sure they have the connections that they need in order to make really good policy. So the, one of the first people who I met who really had a kind of deep, thoughtful answer to how he was trying to make a difference through policy was actually a special advisor. Um, I met him um, when I was first joining the civil service and he was working in the Department for International Development. Uh, so he was working with politicians and he was working with civil servants. Um, and a special advisor is a political appointee. Um, so for any Americans, you probably have quite a few more political appointees, but in the, the British system, we don't have that many. Um, they work very long hours, they work very hard, uh, but they don't get as much kind of screen time as the politicians. But people like David Cameron, uh, Ed Miliband, they have started their careers as special advisors. So it can be a stepping stone to be a politician, but equally, in this case, the person I was talking to had decided to really focus on neglected tropical diseases while they were a special advisor at the Department for International Development. And because they knew that these neglected tropical diseases were in fact neglected, um, there is a lot that we could do with a relatively small amount of money to save people's lives and to make people's lives a lot better. Um, and so during the time that he was at this department, um, him together with the ministers and civil servants he was working with um, increased the UK's funding commitment on neglected tropical diseases um, from protecting about 100 million people to about 200 million people. So potentially this group of people, this special advisor who I was talking to, the minister who's working with, and those civil servants could have saved 100 million lives with that change, which is really mind-blowing if you think about it. Even if that money would have gone to something good that might have saved some lives, it seems like to me that it's really unlikely they would have saved 100 million lives with that money. So that in itself could be potentially the most impact he has in his entire life. And there might be some bigger things that he moves on to later. Maybe he will go into politics for himself and, and make even bigger changes. Maybe he will work at another organization. But even already in his 20s and 30s, he was having an impact like this, which I just think is phenomenal. Um, of course, the politicians also can have a really major impact. If you think about um, not even things that are directly measured in lives saved, but can have a major impact on people's well-being um, or their, or, you know, or their kind of health in the future. Um, if you think about like the financial crisis, uh, Gordon Brown convening all of these different leaders and coming to an agreement of how they were going to work together to deal with the financial crisis. If they had done it better, potentially things would have gone even better. If they had not done it at all, what would that impact have been? If you had had people who felt really not confident about their understanding of the financial system and not really able to speak to it or not comfortable convening a group of people together, what would that impact have been? So actually having the right person there in that moment, having someone who understood the financial system, really, really important. Um, another example, of course, is civil servants like me. Uh, and I wanted to give an example of a civil servant who I worked with. Um, when I was working on fuel poverty, there was a civil servant who I worked with who had been working on fuel poverty for 10 or 15 years, longer than anyone else who worked there. Um, and when I walked into a room with kind of, you know, six months or a year of experience, I had to really make the case for why I wanted to do anything that I wanted to do. If I was walking into a room with some people from industry or with some people from charities who worked with people in fuel poverty, I had to sit them down and talk to them step by step why what I wanted to do made sense, and I wasn't just out to get people, and I wasn't trying to, you know, mess anyone around. Like, I really did want to help, and I really had to kind of prove myself every time. Uh, this person also came with me uh, fairly often to those meetings. She rarely said anything, but if she said something, Everyone in the room listened to her. She had so much credibility because she had the knowledge of having worked in that area for years and years. She had the experience. She worked in the, sometimes she worked in this area for longer than the industry people she was talking to. And so they knew that she knew what she was talking about. And she used it rarely, but when she did put her foot down, everyone was like, okay, this is, this is what we're doing. Like, we'll, we'll go along with this because we, they trusted her. 
she had built those relationships, she had built that expertise. And I think um, you might have a different niche that you think is especially important. You might want to focus on something like uh, the social story impact, talk about things like climate change, um, global poverty, uh, things like that. Um, but whatever kind of cause that you're interested in, I think there is so much power in having developed that expertise and those relationships over time. Or alternatively, even just being a little bit better than the next best person who would have been in that role can be really, really impactful. If you're a senior civil servant here in the UK, you are overseeing budgets of millions or billions. You are overseeing teams of potentially hundreds of people. Uh, it's a pretty big responsibility. And if you can improve the way things are done by just a fraction of a percent, actually that really makes a difference to people's lives. Um, similarly, at times you might feel like you aren't having an impact because the politicians in the roles don't necessarily care a huge amount about the particular topic you're talking about. But if you're willing to stick it out over several years, you will work with lots of different politicians with lots of different thoughts on the topic, some of whom probably don't think about it at all, but some of whom are really interested. And so if you really care about a particular topic, you can serve the government of the day by, in some years, being pretty quiet, or working with industry, seeing what incremental improvements you can make, and also being ready for that time where someone really does take an interest. All right. So the next thing that I want to talk about is that it's not necessarily just about making a difference to the policy that is, is being built by by politicians, with civil servants, you can also improve the processes that the government is using to make decisions. And sometimes that can be a bigger win than the individual policy decision itself. If you end up improving the decision-making process as a whole, um, then that could be a win for, for decades. In this case, the one I want to highlight is impact assessments. For a while, the civil servants didn't have to report what kind of impact their different regulations we're going to have, um, they, they just have to say, we think this is a good idea, and, and politicians have to say, they think it's a good idea, and then it moves forward. There, a system came in about 20 years ago where now you have to kind of formally say, here's the economic case, here's the social case, you have to kind of write up your decision-making process, you have to make that public. You can say, actually, there's no economic case, we're going ahead with this anyways, but then that comes up a lot in the debates in Parliament. <laughs> So it's really changed the way that people think about the policy they're making. It's made it a little bit more rigorous, and it's been a very sticky change. I don't think anyone would feel comfortable getting rid of impact assessments at this point. They've really become a part of the fabric of how people think about policy making in the UK. So this change has probably had more impact than any individual policy change, or, or many of the individual policy changes uh, during Tony Blair's time. This was, this was introduced during the Blair era. When he was introducing it, he would say, civil servants and ministers, regulation often appears costless, but for those delivering on the front line in schools or hospitals or small businesses, it is not. Civil servants should not be judged on just how much they regulate, but how effectively they achieve their aims without regulation. And I think hearing that kind of rationale, you think, okay, this makes sense. How can we make sure that everyone's doing this consistently for a long time? If you can make that kind of change, that can have a real impact for a long time. Finally, you don't have to work in policy to affect policy. I was online and I saw a forum post uh, where someone had talked about pestering embassies to reduce non-policy barriers to movement. And I was like, this looks like exactly the weird kind of thing I would love to read about. And it was great. So this guy, as far as I can tell, is just an average American who um, decided that he it wasn't fair that some Kenyans can't get a tourist visa to the U.S. because they don't offer enough appointments at the embassy. He thought that was wrong. He was annoyed that the embassy just didn't hire enough staff to have enough appointments for everyone who wanted to get an appointment. He thought everyone should be able to get an appointment and should be judged on the merits. I don't know why he picked Kenya. I, I don't know why he picked this niche. But he started calling the Kenyan embassy. <laughs> Um, was he? Yeah. 
Jet now. Oh, that's incredible. I love that. He's, I think he's an icon. I haven't met him. Um, but I just, I love this example. Um, and he wrote up as well, like, how his experience was. Because he didn't end up getting the changes that he wanted, but he did end up learning a lot. And I think this is the kind of thing where if you just try it, first off, you will learn a lot. But secondly, sometimes it just works. Sometimes you just call the embassy and they were like, yeah, you know what, you're right, that's what we should change things. Or more likely, they kind of, you know, try to pacify you and, and you know, put you to one side. But then they're kind of thinking about it and the next time a meeting comes up about staffing, they say, you know what, this is really understaffed. We should have more appointments available. And, you know, it's just something that's been in the back of their mind. So I love this example. I think absolutely people should pick really niche things to pester people about in policy. Sometimes it works. Uh, other things that people can do without working in policy. Obviously vote. This is obviously something you can do. Uh, in the UK we have government consultations on pretty much every change that we make ever. You can respond to those. Someone like me will read it. So you don't need like a whole letter writing campaign because I'll well, see the arguments the first time, I don't need it 1,500 times. But um, you, you just write up kind of why you think what you think, and if for some reason I hadn't considered that particular angle, then I'll be like, oh, okay. This, should I do something different? Um, and occasionally government will do something different. It's not that often, but again, it's worth doing it because when it does help, it helps a lot. Similarly, you can contact your elected officials. Um, like I said, this can work especially well if you say positive things sometimes. Um, it doesn't have to be every time. Um, and I'm not even just like the compliment sandwich where you say a positive thing and then you're kind of mean and then the positive thing. Uh, literally just, if you care about a topic and there's a politician out there who also cares about the topic and is trying to make a difference on the topic, Encourage them. They have no encouragement. They hard, hardly ever does anyone say something nice to a politician about something they're trying to do in politics. They get lots of people being mean to them. They get very few people encouraging them. So if there are people who are trying to do something on something you care about, especially if they're on the losing side, they need encouragement to keep going and not give up. So that's something that you can do, absolutely. Especially if you have some kind of connection to them, like they're in your constituency or, or in your town generally. Um, or, or some other kind of connection to them. The other thing you can do is develop expertise and sometimes a little niche. Like I said, it can be a bit random, like who picking the, I don't know why you picked the Kenyan accent, you maybe get a connection, it, I'm not sure. Um, but if you have a connection to something, even better. If you work on logistics at Amazon, can you think about how the supply chain for PPE worked during the pandemic and think about some lessons that you might be able to learn for the next pandemic. A lot of what you're telling people, a lot of what you tell politicians might be the same as what anyone without that background would also tell them, but maybe you have a little bit of extra expertise to, be able to evaluate what other people are saying and maybe you have a little bit more credibility because of your day job. Or similarly, if you are a doctor or some other healthcare professional, maybe you can talk to politicians about tuberculosis or another disease that they haven't heard much about but that you think some of the aid budget should be directed towards. Um, these sorts of things, having like a little bit of credibility from your day job, I think can just tip the scale in terms of people being willing to take you a little bit more seriously or potentially even meet with you to have a conversation. All right. So, that's developing policy. There's a lot of space there. There's a lot of different things people can do, whether you are thinking you might be interested in becoming a politician yourself, becoming a special advisor or another political appointee, whether you think you might want to be a civil servant, whether you think, actually, I might like to spend a little bit of my spare time um, influencing policy. I promise you it is so much more satisfying to email your member of parliament or representative than it is to post on Twitter, especially when not that many people like it, so it's a bit sad. But if your MP writes back to you, that's, that's a good feeling. The next topic I wanna to talk about is when you make a great policy that never gets used, but why that can be a good thing, actually. Uh, throughout your career, there, especially if you're working on this full time,
mine in particular talks with these ones are opposite four. You, not all your relatives will be used, and some people find that very dispiriting. Some people think I've worked on so many policies and they keep getting cut. Like, what am I doing here? Is this a waste of my time? And so, to be fair, sometimes it is just people wasting their time. But in some, <laughs> I, I can't lie. Sometimes it's like you know, when sometimes it's just bad luck as well. They made a great policy, and then there was a ministerial reshuffle or whatever, and uh, it's tough. But there are times where it is absolutely worthwhile to create a policy that will never get used. In fact, the policy that I am the most proud of developing is one that did not get used. Um, so, at the beginning of kind of COVID, it was sort of springtime, right? Um, and I was working on a fuel poverty strategy. And I was like, I mean, I was thinking this was gonna go on for like 10 years, because I was looking at timelines for like previous vaccine development, and I was like, this is gonna be certainly next winter. Everyone was like, see you in a couple weeks at the office. And I was like, that's okay. <laughs> Um, so I was thinking like years, and I was like, okay, next winter, we know COVID is a respiratory disease, but we know that when people don't heat their houses properly, they tend to be more likely to contract respiratory diseases and more likely to go to hospitals from them. So we know things like the flu, they're more likely to go to the hospital. And I was seeing a lot of like flatten the curve memes, and I was like, this seems not great. Maybe we should be making sure people heat their homes. This seems really important. And also, if people are staying at home and they're not able to go out of their house, they will have even higher heating bills and people who haven't been able to afford to heat their homes before are gonna struggle even more. Because before, maybe they, during the day they went to work or they went to the library or whatever, and they won't even have those spaces. So, we need to think about how people are gonna heat their homes during COVID lockdowns and make sure that people aren't necessarily ending up in hospital. Um, and my team really didn't want extra work, but then I pitched them this, and they were like, okay, actually, you're right. We do need to do this. And so I've worked with um, a lot of people across my department and across other departments, Department of Health, a Department for lo Local Communities, and we came up with kind of a plan of, okay, here's how this policy could work, here's who we would target it at, and we pitched it to ministers, and the ministers didn't go for it. You know what they did instead is they increased the amount of universal credit so that people in low incomes could afford more things generally. I think that was probably the right call. I think that was, BWP was like, there's no way they're gonna increase universal credit. And they did increase universal credit. I think that was a great call personally. Um, but I'm still glad that I came up with my kind of more targeted policy option for them. Because if they had decided, like DWP predicted, sorry, Department for Work and Pension, I've gone into work with it. Um, <laughs> if they had decided that they didn't want to raise universal credit for that time being, but they still wanted to do something to help people with their heating bills, then I would have been there with an option for them to do. If we had started at that point to develop the policy, it would have been too late. We needed to develop it in advance in most cases, I would say, you need to be developing a few different policy options at the same time. It's not always the same team either. Sometimes it's different teams who are developing policy options. And often only one of them gets picked. And that can be disappointing, or you can be excited about it and say, I am so glad I had a strong policy option and they were able to pick an even stronger one. This is great. That's the situation we want things to be in. We, we want to be in that situation where you've developed a really strong policy option and something even better was able to move forward. So I'm really proud of this policy that I developed that never got used. And I think there's a lot of situations like that where if you become a civil servant or if you become like a researcher for a political party or you work at a think tank, you will develop policy options that never get used and you should be really proud of them because it is better to have a lot of good policy ideas out there and then by definition some of them won't get used but that's a better world to live in than the one where yours always gets picked because there's no good policy options out there. Similarly, you could work on one of these things. You could work on national security, you could work on pandemic preparedness, you could work on asteroid stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want those things to be used. You don't want there to be another pandemic. You don't want the asteroid thing. <laughs> Um, but I still personally really want a smart, 
person full of integrity who really cares about this stuff to work on it. I want them to be really dedicated to it, um, especially the nuclear war person. I really want them to not want it to happen, but I want them to be prepared in case it does. I want them to think through what are the next steps, what would we do, how, how does this work. I want us to have plans for all of these really low probability events that would be really a big deal. And I think that is actually like a really noble thing to potentially dedicate your career to, is to figuring out contingency plans for really extreme scenarios that will likely never happen. And so one way to look at your career in that situation is to say, oh, I've worked on this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and I've had no impact on the world. But another way of looking at it is that if something had happened, we would be really happy we had a plan in place. I've done something noble, I've done something useful. Um, it was high expected value, if you like. Um, and I, I just really want to encourage people that even if your policies are never used, it can still be the right call to work on them. All right, so the third thing I want to talk about is that you don't always have to be the person developing the policies in order to have an impact in policy. So far I've been mostly talking about how you can create the policies or you can shape the policies. But that's definitely not the only way to make sure that high quality policy is getting made. Uh, one thing you could do is work for or with a really skilled altruistic policy maker and free them up to do great work. So my very first civil service job, I had an amazing manager, his name was James. He was a really wonderful mentor to me. He taught me everything about his job. He told me like the first day, before the first day, he was like, right, I'm gonna train you to take my job. And I was like, brilliant, I'm absolutely up for that. Um, and so he did. And about a year in, he had trained me on pretty much everything he did day to day. And we had something called spending review, uh, which is where you have the chance to bid for money. And he had a really good idea for something he wanted to do related to fuel poverty. And so he started working on that and people tended to agree with him that this was a pretty good idea. And the more people who agreed with him and the farther he got through, there's kind of like a, a battle royale of ideas uh, that happens internally. And the farther he got through that, the further his idea progressed, the more time it took to develop these ideas further, to really think through the policy, to work up the business case, to figure out how would we price these things, how would we kind of work with the commercial team to like get the right people in place to to do these policies. Um, it became very time consuming, it became very intensive. And so I just took over the rest of his job. <laughs> um, and I did all the day-to-day -day stuff. I didn't really get involved with the business case. I didn't really get involved with spending review. Um, but that was just all he did. He didn't have to do anything else. He just forwarded me any email that was not related to the spending review and I took care of it. So he did not have to think about it. And in the end, um, he got all the way to the end and the home upgrade grant became a policy and I think it's a great policy. Um, he did an amazing job and he's an amazing civil servant. I don't know if he would have been able to do that and do his day job at the same time. So I think if he hadn't had someone in my role taking on the business as usual stuff, I'm not sure if he would have been able to develop that policy. And so in some ways I think like some of the impact from my work has actually been his work. Um, yeah, it, it, there's just things that we were kind of legally required to do that he would have had to keep doing in kind of his evenings and weekends. He was already working evenings and weekends on this, so I just don't think he would have been able to put the same attention into it. Uh, it doesn't have to be energy efficiency policies. It could be anything that you think is really effective. It could be anything that you think is really important that you could be working on. Um, animal welfare and reducing animal cruelty, it could be working on pandemic preparedness, whatever it is, if you can find someone who's really good at that job and you can help free them up to do, spend more time on the stuff that they're really good at, um, whether that's by answering emails and parliamentary questions or whether that is by managing their schedule or whether that is by going with them to meetings until you can basically predict what they're gonna say and then you just go to the meetings for them and they can stay back and do more work. Whatever it is, it can be really useful. It can also advance your career because for me, by learning all of the things 
that he normally did, and then having him step away and me do all of the things, that's how I got my promotion. Um, because I had proved I could do the job, basically. So it was a good opportunity for me as well. Um, but things like working for a really effective civil servant, being a private secretary to a politician, working for a political party, doing research or speech writing, all of those things, you can be really helping someone who you think is really effective with a lot of integrity. Another thing that is extremely useful is getting the right people into the right role. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, okay, if I became really senior, if I was like a CEO level, then I could hire some great people and I would be just like, that would be just world changing. And that can be a really good way to have an impact. But if you're a civil servant in the UK, you can just sign up to help hire people when you first start. Um, there you go through like a day of training, not even like a couple hours of training, and then you, you can help hire people. And of course, this is only impactful if you are better at hiring people than the other person who would be on the panel. But sometimes you can be. For one, if you have in your mind that actually this is potentially one of the most important things you're gonna be working on that month or year, um, you might take it a little bit more seriously and think a little harder about it. You might be a little bit less, you know, more aware that being a little bit hungry can make you cranky and not like someone. So you might be, oh, actually I think this is Anyways, you might be a little bit more aware of your mood and how that might influence kind of how you're evaluating candidates, and you might think pretty hard about it, or you might do some of your own kind of research and training about how to be as fair of a hiring panel member as possible, and, and really try to get the best person for the job. Everyone's trying to get the best person for the job, but it doesn't seem impossible to get an edge here, and it makes a huge difference, especially if you're hiring someone from outside the organization who might be in the organization for decades. Similarly, once you have a bit of a network within your organization, whether that's a political party or the civil service or something like that, same thing, if you notice someone who's really good at their job, especially someone a bit junior, you just start talking them up around the management. If you're kind of like middle manager, this is a great strategy. You find the best junior people and you just talk about how great their work is all the time. Eventually, someone's gonna notice and might offer them a promotion or a really good opportunity. Because what you want, if you want good policy to be made, is you want good people to get promoted fast. Um, good people meaning people who are good at their jobs and have a lot of integrity. People who aren't just looking to get promoted but actually care about the people or the animals or um, whatever on the other end. So if you find those people, help them get promoted by talking them up around management, sending them per, like vacancy information, telling them that they're, they're really good, because a lot of them don't seem to realize it. So let them know that they're really good, give them specific examples of times they've been really good. Um, and then do things like offer to help review their CV, or even do like a mock interview with them. If you've been on a hiring panel recently, and you've been helping hire people, you might offer to your friend or to a junior colleague, hey, I will sit with you in a room, I will pretend to be an interviewer, and you can go through all of your examples and practice to get the nerves out. And that can be really, really helpful for people because they often haven't done a lot of interviews and they get really nervous, and doing it once first really helps. Also because sometimes they don't realize that they've been rambling about something for three minutes, and if you tell them, it can really help them. Uh, similarly, uh, you can mentor people through organizations like Magnify Mentoring, uh, which is a great organization involved with the effect cultures and community. Um, they've really helped me out in my career, so if you have a policy career or want a policy career, I would recommend them. They don't just do policy, but they're really lovely. Um, and not just civil servants, you could potentially also influence the selection of political candidates. Um, I went to university with a young woman who would be an amazing member of parliament. She would be so good, she's so articulate, she's so intelligent. After we went to university together, apparently she went off and got a law degree. And I'm sure she's really good at that too. I think she works in an advocacy organization now. Like she's, she's gonna run the Canada in like 10, 15 years, I'm sure. And I don't know if she realizes it yet, but. <laughs> um, a couple years ago, I got in touch with her and I was like, 
look, I know we've fallen out of touch, but if you ever run for anything, I will donate $1,000 to your campaign. Like, just call me, <laughs> tweet at me, whatever. I, I will definitely, definitely donate to your campaign because you would be great, and I know she would be great. She's full of integrity. Uh, she is really intelligent. She really cares. She's very compassionate. I know she would be a great politician. And people who would be great politicians sometimes don't want to be politicians, so it can help to give them a little nudge. Um, similarly, like you can join a political party and you can get involved in that more formal process as well. But honestly, if you know someone who would make a really good politician, um, you should tell them and maybe even offer them a little bit of money just so that they know that you're like serious. Like whatever's a lot of money in your social circle, like like a little bit more than makes sense. Don't be like, I donate 10 bucks to your campaign. That's, <laughs> that's be more than that. Um, but yeah, like we need good politicians. People think it's a great job, but like anyone who would be good at it, uh, pretty quickly realizes this is not that good of a job. It's really long hours, and people are mean to you a lot. Um, and like to be a good politician, you need to care about people. Uh, but if you care about people, you end up not being a good politician. It's kind of a, if you care too much, you can't really do it anymore. Yeah, so they need people to support them, they need encouragement, they need people to say, actually, you can do this, and to make it real for them. All right. The last thing to talk about is giving policymakers what they need in order to be successful. Policymakers are, generally speaking, not experts on what they're making decisions on. Occasionally, they can be, like I said, like that person I worked with on fuel poverty who worked on it for like 15, 15 years. But most of the time, the civil servants are generalists and the politicians are even more generalists. So the politicians in particular need a lot of help. Uh, and you can be the person to help them sometimes. They often don't know surprisingly basic things. So if you can show up and be helpful, they, they will often be grateful to you. Um, if you are an academic, for example, making yourself findable can be really, really useful. Uh, when I worked on fuel poverty, um, there was a woman named Amy, Dr. Amy, um, who is an academic, and she ran this thing, uh, Fuel Poverty Research Network, which is basically an email chain. It just it just emails everyone. Anyone can send an email to everyone. That's that's it. That's basically what they are. And then they occasionally come to Westminster and hold like a parliamentary reception so they can meet people. But they were so useful because they would have a call with us, sometimes at short notice, and I would ask them questions, and they would go back to all the different academics and find out the answers to our questions, and they would let us know what the academics thought and what our different questions. And that is shockingly rare in politics or in policy. It is really, really hard to find people who actually know what they're talking about. They are often like just working on learning stuff about the topic and not actually making themselves available to policy people. They think they're available to policy people, but I don't know, there's a disconnect. This kind of thing is just so useful. The fact that they were willing to come down to London and come into actually like Westminster a couple of times a year really useful. The fact that they were willing to get on a call with us sometimes at short notice, really useful. And then just like having an email, like the server that we could just subscribe to and um, see their emails and see what the academics are talking about. Wonderful. Love that. So this kind of thing is really great if you are an academic or work at a think tank or otherwise someone who knows things. Yeah, it's just so hard to find people who know things. Uh, another example that I've been really inspired by recently is this woman. Her name is Esther Cooper Smith. She recently passed away. Um, but she was known for her kind of dining room diplomacy, I guess. I'm just going to read you an excerpt from her obituary because I just think it's incredible. At Esther Cooper Smith's brunches, luncheons, and soirees, which is numbered in the dozens annually, she delighted in making seating arrangements that held the promise of advancing, if only infinitesimally, the cause of world peace. People need a place out of the public spotlight to meet and talk, she told the New York Times in 1987. I'd like to make it possible for people to meet each other. She took credit for introducing the wives of Egypt Egyptian President Anwar Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, 
signatories of the Count David Accords brokered by Carter. Biden credited Mrs. Mrs. Cooper Smith with helping facilitate the Accords, with working to foster dialogue and understanding between people of different cultures and faiths, especially in the Middle East. Mrs. Cooper Smith organized trips to the Soviet Union, to Middle East, Asia, and Africa for the spouses of senators and cabinet officials, and was widely credited with cultivating the cross-cultural understanding that is the intangible basis of diplomacy. So I think that's an incredibly inspiring example. She would invite people from all different political backgrounds, from different cultural backgrounds, and she would have them over for dinner, and she would seek them in a way that she thought might help world peace. People would occasionally complain to her that you can't put those two people together. And she would be like, it's my house. <laughs> <laughs> it's my rules. <laughs> um, she just seems so inspiring to me. She did occasionally hold formal diplomatic roles, but very often she was just, uh, she was in DC in informal capacity, hosting people in her home, facilitating those relationships so they could get to know each other. And I think for a lot of those, us, those that level is not necessarily accessible to us, but the, some of us do know some people who might benefit from knowing each other whether that's civil servants from different areas of government, whether that's a few politicians and a few academics. Um, a lot of us, I think, have some level of network where we can use our hospitality to facilitate some of those relationships. All right, next steps. I love this quote, I think it's really true. Decisions are made by those who show up. Whether you think about working full-time in policy or politics, or whether this might be a sign of things that you engage in occasionally, you might develop some kind of niche, or just email your MP or representative occasionally. There is so much to be gained in policy. It's uh, what some people call a highly leveraged way to influence both your nation and also the world. And there's a lot of power in this there's a lot of power in just showing up on a regular basis, regularly contacting someone or regularly um, getting involved and establishing yourself, with, get, getting yourself a little bit of credibility as someone who knows things, someone who knows people, someone who has a little bit of expertise and can be trusted. Uh, if you can consistently be helpful to people who are trying to make good policy, that's really all you need to do. And funnily enough, that's true all the way through your career, even if you're the president or the prime minister, being helpful so people trying to make good policy is really what you're aiming for and will get you invited back to places. So if you're considering a policy or politics career, you can check out the Christians for Impact profile on policy careers. If you're a UK civil servant, Impactful Government Careers is a good place to get in touch with a network of people who are interested in having an impact with their civil service career. Um, and if you're interested in joining the civil service, I have uh, frequently asked questions on the Effective Altruism Forum um, that I think has been useful for some people. Um, so it's about kind of how do you get a role in the civil service, um, what are the steps you'd have to go through in the interview process, uh, what are some ways you can prepare for those interviews? If you're thinking about next steps in terms of influencing outside of your 9 to 5, uh, informed voting, obviously, um, putting the information you know out into the world, writing some blog posts, tweeting, but also just like the Fuel Poverty Research Network example, you know, make an email list or just let people know somehow that you're out there, you're willing to help them, respond to a consultation, say you're willing to talk more, any of those things. Um, emailing your elected officials is also a great option and encouraging someone great to run for office or connecting people who should know each other is a wonderful way to improve policy. A lot of these things as well, there can be seasons in our lives where they make more sense than others. So they can be things that you start now and maybe you don't see much of a, a difference yet. But if you kept doing these things for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Esther Cooper Smith was hosting her dinner parties into her 90s. If you started now and you were hosting these parties into your 90s, imagine what kind of influence you could have, imagine what kind of impact you could have on the world. So I think that's, that's my real message today, is if you're interested in policy or politics, there is a lot of power in showing up consistently, being a consistently helpful person, and developing expertise in some kind of niche. Uh, I'm going to stick around for the next
however long we have left. Um, and I'd love to chat about any kind of questions or follow-up. Thank you so much. Many of the questions uh, that have popped up so far were actually about like, how do I get involved, how do I help. We have around five minutes left now before the lunch starts, so I'm trying to be quick with the few questions that we have, and I'll group them into themes. Okay, great. And I think one of the, the first themes, the one of the more popular ones, is about the topic of, well, we're talking about effective impact. There's a question of all the civil service in the UK sometimes gets a lot of flack for being inefficient or bureaucratic. Sure. And uh, we're on the like, well, European, if you could do one thing to reform it, what would, what would it be? Oh my gosh. And I guess it's also kind of linked to a question of like, for example, what did Dominic Cummings get right and wrong about the UK civil service? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, we're on the like, your opinion on Civil that. service. Um, so one of the things that Dominic Cummings, I think, got right about the civil service is I would love to see an increase in like math literacy. I mean, I don't think I would through his methods, but I would love to see um, uh, improvement in kind of how well we deal with numbers and analysis. I think that would be really helpful. One of the things he gets wrong is I think he thinks that civil servants just hate change uh, or are really resistant to change, and sometimes that can be true, but I think there are a lot of civil servants who really do want to make a change and really do care, um, and they want to go through the steps to make sure that it's the right change. And similarly on the question of kind of bureaucracy, I think that's the trade-off we often face is how do we make sure that we're making the right change? The people will often say two things. They'll say civil service is really slow and bureaucratic, and they don't even talk to the experts who really know things. Those two things are kind of opposites. If you want to take the time to talk to the experts and make sure you're getting things right, it's going to take time. It's going to slow things down. So you, you have to be willing to go through a, a certain level of kind of bureaucracy if you want to be you know, confident that you're getting things right. And there's sometimes where you are confident, but it's, I think, worth going through the process anyways because there are the other 90% of the time you're less confident. It, you know, it's a trade-off you have to make. It's, it's worth having the requirements in place, the checks and balances. I really think so kind of linking to the, that impact of the sort of expert advice and taking the time mm. for that, there's a question of, how influential are think tanks, PA consultants, etc.? Like, do ministers and civil servants actually read think tank, think tank or industry reports? Yeah, I was going to talk about this and I forgot. Um, no, I'm really happy that that came up. Um, I have actually gotten a lot of questions from like special advisors about think tank reports or for senior, from senior officials. There are definitely people who read these reports and really do take them seriously. So I think that can be a path to impact. The way I think about it here in the UK is if you already, if the topic that you care about is already on the government's agenda, um, it's worth being in the civil service because they will ask you for advice on it. And it's always nice that people ask you for advice on something rather than having to kind of um, push. But if it's not already on the government's agenda, then getting that public support, speaking publicly about a think tank, can be very useful. So that's kind of how I, I tend to think about it. It's obviously not that simple, but if there's something where there's already a civil service job about it, then maybe you want that job. If there's not already a civil service job, maybe you want to work at a think tank and get there to be a civil service job about it. Very interesting. And it's kind of linked to like another few of the questions popping up about kind of the career choice. Mm. And uh, I think they're both questions on like uh, how feasible is it to, for example, pivot into the civil service lead career? What are the best strategies for this and skills needed? But at the same time, there's also a question like on the opposite side. Yeah. So how can you develop an ambitious, uh, agentic, innovative cultures in government? And actually, when should you just set up a new organization versus work with an existing ones? So it's kind of the question of like, when is the right time and how to enter, but also like, are there times when it works and you have something separate? Yeah, for sure. So I think it's worth, in the civil service, I think it's a really good training ground. I think it's worth people who want to do a policy career spending a year or two there, even if they don't intend to stay in government. Because I just think you'll learn a lot, the managers have to really care about your development, and you will see how things work from the inside, which is just so useful. Um, after that, you might want to pivot to a new organization, although I don't know if you'd be ready to start one necessarily. The other time that it's quite useful to pivot out of the civil service is once you're like at the executive level, senior civil servant. 
Um, that is also a, a path that, that moves a lot. Um, the other direction, sorry, what was, what was the other one? It's about joining the civil service from elsewhere. Yeah. yeah, but also then kind of like, when is the right time? Mm -hmm. like how, how to make it more legitimate in itself, when is the right time to just work with a different type of thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, I think you need it to be in agentic in order to make an impact in the civil service to some extent, because the people who make the biggest difference are the people who look at the stuff they haven't been asked to work on yet, but maybe should be. That's really how you have that impact. So, like, for example, when I was working on fuel poverty, and no one had asked me to work on COVID and fuel poverty, I was just like, this needs to be done, and I pitched other people on it and got people together to support this idea. That's when you can have an impact. So, yeah, in some ways, you have to be more agentic to work with, like in a bureaucratic organization. Um, in terms of joining the civil service from elsewhere, um, they're really open to transferable experience um, and really open to generalists. And my FAQ on the Infected Altruism Forum goes into some of the things that we would look for. But my biggest tip would be you don't need to uh, exaggerate or be vague or focus on your team's accomplishments. It is really useful, even as, especially at the junior level, but at any level, to be really, really specific about what you specifically did. One of the most impressive examples I saw from someone just joining from university was that she had worked at a Waitrose and in the coffee shop and she had performed how the queue system worked. And she had like gotten advice from other people and she had talked to some of the customers and she had changed the, the system for how people lined up for their coffees and made it a lot more efficient. That was so specific and I could tell she had actually done it. It was just her, it wasn't like a whole group of like 20 people. And I was like, yeah, that's the kind of skills that we're looking for. So um, being really clear and specific is really helpful. Okay, thank you. I think running towards the end, I'm just, I'm just looking for you. Uh, as a last uh, question, but also I wish like, how can kind of we help support your, even right now your projects? Um, and kind of also as the Christians for impact, mm. um, like how, how can members support the civil service? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, personally, I'm on maternity leave right now, so <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'll come back to you in a few months. Um, but I mean, I think we always need your prayers. Obviously, I think people in, in making policy, like, they need that kind of support. Um, I think we also need people who know stuff to make that available as much as possible. So I'm always looking for people to respond to consultations. The problem, one of the problems I need to have is I would work on stuff that affected renters and landlords and the landlords would always show up and there was no one to represent and speak to the renters. Um, so those sorts of situations, it's really helpful to have someone, anyone, <laughs> speak up and, and put themselves forward. Um, any situation where there's not really money in, in representing a group, it can be really hard to find a representative. Um, yeah, so responding to those consultations is often a first step. Cool. Thank you so much for your